Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with you all. Always a privilege to worship our triune God each Lord's Day. Well, here at the Response Church, our aim is to preach the word in season and out of season. You need the word of God. Man does not live off bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. And we do not just need snippets and pieces of God's word, but we need the whole counsel of God. And so the chief way we try to accomplish this great tall order is simply by going through whole books of the Bible, text by text by text. This morning, we are continuing through Romans, through the book of Romans, and we are concluding Romans chapter 9 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up, open up to Romans chapter 9. We'll be concluding it this morning. And would you please stand for the reading of today's text? Our text today is Romans chapter 9, verses 30 through 33. This is the word of God. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is, a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer. Father, we beseech you this morning for your mercy and your kindness, your mercy that has provided life for us yet again. You have given us our daily bread and you are feasting. You are giving us a feast this morning, the feast of your word, that which we live by, that which is eternal in a world of temporal things that moth and rust destroy all around us. This morning, you give us your eternal word. Help us to feast, Lord, and help me, a pitiful preacher, to preach your word in all truth, with the power of your spirit, and with deep conviction, that your sheep would hear, feast, and live, that they would hear and be wise, that they would hear and apply your very word now and forever to their lives. Help them to do this, Lord. Give us more of your spirit now, that we might be more and more conformed into the image of your son, your wonderful son. Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, last week, last week we saw the continued fruit of God's unconditional election that we've been studying since the beginning of Romans chapter 9. And really, it kind of led us into it at the end of chapter 8. And it's really just the natural outflow of all eight chapters prior to Romans 9. By the time you get to Romans 9, you see that there is no hope in man. You see that lest God work through his spirit in a sovereign way, no man will be saved. And that is what we've been studying throughout our time in Romans 9. And last week, Paul focused on the Gentile side of things predominantly. He said, those who were not, God said, those who are not my people will be my people. Those who are not my people will now be my people. And he was quoting the prophet Hosea. And we saw that he was referring to Gentiles. Gentiles, again, are every single person outside ethnic Israel. Composes every nation, every kingdom, every person who's ever lived outside ethnic Israel, okay, can, falls under the banner of Gentile. And God, consistently, as Paul has been teaching, simply by his declaration, by his planning, his declaration, and his work, made those who were not his people, his people. All right, that's largely what we saw. People who once worshiped false gods, all of us, while we were yet his enemies, he saved us. He saved us in Christ Jesus and praise God for it. That's what we saw last week. This week, Paul is explaining further how the Gentiles stand justified before God. Last week, he said they're justified, all right? This week, he's focusing on a particular, very, very crucial and important means by how justification comes. That is by faith, all right? That's the focus of today's text. 
And on the flip side of how the Gentiles stand justified by faith, you have the Israelites who stand unjustified. All right? The bottom line of our text today is not complicated. The exegesis is quite simple. The Gentiles have obtained righteousness, that is justification, right standing before God by faith. That's what he says. He's talking about an eschatological, eternal justification. He's not saying that they do certain things and therefore they're righteous some days. No, no, he's speaking to complete and total eternal justification. They will receive eternal life. They stand justified, even though they did not pursue the law, even though they were not law keepers. They didn't even know the law. The law wasn't given to them written on tablets of stone, and yet they stand justified by faith, okay? Now, the Israelites did not obtain righteousness, Okay, that's what he says, because rather than place their faith in the triune God and chiefly the son of God, his life, his death, and his resurrection, they chose to pursue the law as a means. Instead of pursuing the law by faith, okay, with a trusting in the law giver, they pursued the law trusting in themselves to accomplish the law. That's what we see. He's speaking to the Mosaic law here, the the Ten Commandments. And they were pursuing it thinking that they could obtain righteousness by their own works, he says. Now, to the Jew and Gentile receiving this letter in Rome and all Jewish people forever after, to this day, the primary reason, Paul elaborates, that they have failed to obtain this righteousness is because they've stumbled over the stumbling stone. Okay? The reason is because of their own sinful rejection of the Son of God. Their own sinful rejection of the Son of God, Jesus, the Christ, given to them freely, the Messiah. Rather than receive the work of God in the Son, the work of the promised Christ that they knew the promises to, they knew he was coming, and they should have known really what he would accomplish and do. They pursued the law as a means to righteous justification before God. And of course they failed like anyone would. The required faith, all right, the required faith for salvation for both Jews and Gentiles is exactly the same. It's exactly the same. The biggest difference between these two groups of people, Gentiles and ethnic Israelites, is that the Jews had the foremost opportunity to recognize the stumbling stone when he came. They had the foremost opportunity to recognize the Christ when he was right in front of them, to recognize the Messiah. They should have recognized the Lord, their God, when he took on flesh and dwelt among them. They were given the promises. They were given the scriptures. They were given the covenants. It was their forefathers that taught them all the Lord had ever done. They should have recognized them. That's the biggest difference between these two groups. Whereas the Gentiles, they know none of this. They're just out there worshiping sun gods, worshiping themselves, worshiping all kinds of things. They weren't given the covenants. They weren't given all the scriptures on who the Christ would be, what he would look like, what he would do, the prophecies that he would fulfill. The Jews should have recognized God right in front of them. It was the Lord their God, but they did not. So I want to first evaluate verses 31 and 32 to see if the Israelites' faithlessness, faithlessness is towards God and their faith in their own works actually is justified at all. If it makes sense, all right? And the conclusion will be, it certainly does not. So verses 31 and 32, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. So the Israelites pursued the law without faith, in the God of the law, without faith in the God of the law. So let's look at the Mosaic law and see why this is such a fatal and inexcusable flaw and sin the Israelites have committed. The preface to the law giving, the law comes in Exodus chapter 20. The preface to that is the Exodus account. God saving his people from Egypt. The preface before that is God creating people by grace. God redeeming people. God clothing Adam and Eve, God giving the promises to Abraham, not because of anything in Israel, not because they were some spectacular people, not because they were more morally righteous than anyone else, but by grace, 
That is the preface to the giving of the law. But here, here is the, the very verse before the giving of the law. Exodus chapter 20, verse two. The very verse right before commandment number one. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Salvation church, whether from Egypt or from the wrath of God due to sin was always conditioned upon the grace of God. It was always conditioned upon the grace of God. The giving of the law, okay, which elements of the law are written on all men's hearts, but all men do not have the law given on tablets of stone. Us Gentiles, we don't even have it written on tablets of stone. We have it in the word now and praise God for it. But we were not the first people given to it written by the finger of God, the text says. We did not receive the promises initially, okay? But salvation is clearly, the giving of the law was prefaced with the reminder that God freed the Israelites. He did the work. He saves. And you'll see this throughout the Exodus account. He is God. He's going to prove that he is God through his power, through his triumph over Pharaoh and Egypt. And he alone is the one who will save his people. Why are they freed from slavery? Because God did the work. Because God chose to do the work. Why are they in slavery? Due to their own sin. So, to go into the commandment, commandment number one and every other commandment after, thinking that salvation is attainable through your own efforts is to forsake the very preface of the commandment and to forget everything God had done prior. God showed mercy to them when their forefathers sinned. God alone saves, all right? And you'll see this as you read from Genesis chapter one, verse one. What do we see? In the beginning was God, not us. What do we do after he creates? We sin. What does he do? Show mercy. The law was given in an ocean of mercy. It was given in the context of grace upon grace upon grace. And the Israelites stumbled over this. They pursued it unto righteousness. Instead of having faith in the God of the law, they just had faith in their own ability to keep the law. And this is a fatal mistake and it's inexcusable. Instead of recognizing the sovereign mercy of God <clears throat> and trusting in the God of sovereign mercy, aka placing faith in God, they chose to place faith in themselves or false gods as we see over and over. And they pursued the law as a means to justification instead of worshiping, instead of worshiping and knowing God rightly through the law. God gives them the law so that he might be worshiped rightly, so that he might be known by his people, that they might know him and he know them. But it's in the context of grace upon grace upon grace. So I want to spend the, really, the rest of our time further exegeting this term faith, all right, and applying it properly to our lives now. We live in a period where this word is so wildly abused, you can barely track down what someone believes about it. It's a thoroughly biblical world, word. It is eternally life-altering if you have a wrong definition of this word, and if you have, more importantly, a wrong object of where your faith must be, okay? So that's what we're gonna to explore today in large part. Verse 30 states that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. They will receive eternal life. They stand justified before God. They are righteous before God, not because of anything they did. What does the verse continue with? That is a righteousness that is by faith. That's how the text concludes. We have to get this right, church. We have to get this right. Faith is not some weird Christian term that we should avoid. It's not something we have the freedom to define ourselves or to let anyone else define but God. It's not something unexplainable. Faith is actually very straightforward. The most straightforward definition of faith given in the scriptures, whenever you're coming up to any, anything, seek the scriptures for a definition. Seek the scriptures for a definition. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, gives us a very concise definition of faith. It says this, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Okay, that's the definition. 
Verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 11 reminds us that righteousness has always come by faith. Verse 2 says, For by it, faith, the people of old receive their commendation. They receive righteousness by faith. And that's what all of Hebrews 11 says. And then verse 3 of Hebrews 11, once more, lists out a foundational truth we know and understand by faith. Verse 3 states, By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So that what is seen is not made out of things that are visible. Okay? So by definition, faith is the conviction of things not seen. The conviction of things not seen according to God and as evidence in all the world. Faith in general, hear me, faith most broadly speaking is not exclusive to Christianity per this definition that God gives us. It's not exclusive to Christianity. Every single person has conviction about unseen things. The object Hear me. The object of the Christian faith is what makes our faith exclusively Christian. And this faith in the right object then produces a distinctly Christian life. All right. So what is the object of the Christian faith? I'm going to repeat this over and over, probably till I die. All right. A number of times today, but we have to get this right. I'm going to remind it to you, Lord willing, 40 years from now as well. Okay, the object of the Christian faith is the triune God. And chiefly, more specifically, the person and work of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. All right? Triune God, and more specifically, the person and work of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now, plenty of other days we will further elaborate on what is his person, uh, who is his person, what is his work. You know, let's explore the triune God. We don't have time to go into all those things today. So you have to know what what those terms are when I say them. But at its simplest, that's what the object of our faith must be in. The triune God, and more specifically, the person and work of the Son of God. All right? Jesus the Christ. Faith, though, at its broadest definition, is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Every single human being who has ever lived, who has ever lived, lives by faith in many things. Everyone has convictions about things they cannot see. Everyone has a conviction about God. He's not visible. Atheists have a conviction about God. Everyone. Nobody lives a life absent of faith. Throughout human history, people have always lived with a foundational conviction in countless unseen things. The atheist, agnostic, The naturalist or someone who believes that all there is in the world is physical, if you can't physically boil it down, then it does not exist, all right? The naturalist, a relativist who thinks that everything's relative. There's no absolute anything. There's no dogmatic anything. Everything's just random and relative, okay? The Greek mythologist, even the person who identifies as having no faith has faith. That is, they have convictions in things unseen, They all have convictions in things not seen. We could spend hours evaluating this long list, but Lord knows I have very limited time. So let's look at one scientific side of this thing, the electromagnetic scale. Okay, if you look at the electromagnetic scale, there is but a sliver to which your naked eye can perceive. One sliver of an entire scale of real things that you cannot see. We see visible light, a sliver of it, but infrared waves, TV broadcast waves, microwaves, infrared radiation, ultraviolet radiation, X-rays, gamma rays, none of these things are visible with the naked eye. Right now, your phones, all of your phones, there are waves going to and fro your phones all over this room. I mean, it would be filling the room if you could see it. We all have phones on us. The reason you can scroll on Facebook and use Google Maps, which is far superior to Apple Maps, The reason you can make phone calls is because, and send text messages, is because you have electromagnetic waves going to and from your phone right now. You cannot see them. By faith, you pick up your phone and you use it. By faith, you perceive that you have, you're actually making a phone call, that you're looking at up-to-date information because there are waves going to and from your phone that you cannot see. You use your phone by faith. 
And this isn't a problem. It's not a problem. We have recently developed technology to see some of the frequencies on the electromagnetic scale, but the frequencies existed long before we could ever see them, all right? If you're an old earth person, which I don't think you should be, but if you're an old earth person, it took millions of years for us to develop a technology to where we could see ultraviolet radiation. But it always existed. There's always been animals that could see an ultraviolet radiation. It was always there. We just could not see it. The fact that we cannot see things does not at all equal it does not exist. And nobody lives consistently with that worldview, even if that's what they confess with their mouth. Okay? Love is another unseen conviction everyone has. Every human fundamentally believes that love exists, though it's unseen. We see the fruits of love, like taking your wife out to a nice dinner, but you are not, you, you are doing that because you love her. Okay? Taking her out to dinner is not the core essence. It's not the being of love. You can't, you can't bottle love up and give it to someone in a bottle. We can make jokes about certain bottles doing that, but we know it's not actually happening. You can't put it in a pill and give someone and boom, there's an there's a exact tangible amount of love that just increased. That's not how it works. The most naturally, naturalistic person on the face of the earth and most atheists and even most confessing agnostics, which an agnostic is someone who says they don't really know anything and we can't really know anything, are usually naturalistic in their confession. They think everything's just physical. If you can't physically test it in a laboratory, then it does not exist, or they won't believe it exists until that you can prove it in a laboratory. All right. But the most naturalistic person on the face of the earth still seeks after loving relationships. They still do. Why? Why? By what faith? Why do they have faith in this thing, love? It's not tangible. You can't test it in a laboratory. So it is really just a blind and meaningless faith in this concept, this idea of love, that they pursue loving relationships while having a confession that says, if you can't test it, you can't do the scientific method upon it, then it does not exist. If we can't prove it, then it doesn't exist. It's very inconsistent. Love is unseen. It's intangible in its essence and yet foundational to all human beings, okay? Now, their response to this might be, well, we can test that when you have loving affections, there's different chemical processes happening in your brain. That would probably be their response to you, all right? There's a lot of problems with this. First, the fact that there are physical processes related to unseen things makes perfect sense in a physical world made by our unseen God. So it makes perfect sense according to the scriptures. Furthermore, the fact that there are physical processes, okay, loving affections go up, certain chemicals are going off in your brain, and we can test those things and see them, okay, this does not at all negate the opportunity. Minimally, it does not negate the opportunity for unseen love to originate, for it to really come from a place that is non-physical. So they say, well, your loving affections are really just coming from certain chemicals firing off. But they're not proving that. They're just demonstrating that there is an attachment between loving affections and a physical process in your brain. But they're not proving that that's where it originates. The reality is everyone seeks after loving relationships because they are made in the image of the triune God. The idea that love is purely, exclusively the byproduct of physical chemical reactions is a silly explanation. That if applied to many other areas of life does not hold up, it's not consistent. Do people eat foods that are physically horrible for them because of purely physical reasons, purely physical chemicals firing off in their brain? Or do they do it for the unseen reason we all know so well is, I like it. Have millions upon millions of men received the call to die on the front lines? They know, I'm going to war, I'm going to be on the front line. That means I got about a 95% chance of dying today. And they do it. Why? Why? because of honor, virtue, love, laying down their lives for their friends and their family. Is this just the byproduct of physical processes going off in their brains, just by random chance? Thank God for those random chances of millions and millions of people dying so that we can live freely right now, so that we can hear the word of God. No, Nobody lives consistently off this. The naturalistic worldview offers no legitimate explanation for these things and millions of other aspects of this life we live. 
you cannot argue that they are purely, merely, exclusively the result of physical chemical reactions. To do so is, to be honest, and I have biblical words to use these things, silly, stupid, foolish, and foundationally, it utterly fails. It utterly fails to defend and explain love, honor, virtue, and morality. The amount of faith, blind faith, in love, honor, virtue, and morality, it takes to say that they are just here by random chance because of random atoms firing off in certain ways at certain times that has no design, no backing, no intentionality, no ultimate meaning, the amount of faith it takes to hold that is astounding. Praise God, the Christian, our salvation is not contingent upon such a large ask. Our faith is contingent upon the triune God who has created all things. That is the object of our faith and chiefly the son of God who came and dwelt among us, who took on flesh, who died for us and who rose. Do you see the faith required to believe these fallacies? It is a high faith. It's a large faith to, to believe such fallacies. The naturalist cannot prove whatsoever that chemical reactions in the brain are the exclusive reason for love, honor, and many other foundational realities that are known to every human who's ever lived across all cultures. You cannot demonstrate their origins in a lab. You can demonstrate a connection, but not their origins. All you can demonstrate at best is that there are at times physical processes going with honorable affections, loving affections, virtuous affections, and moral decisions. Conclusion, the naturalist, who is most often an atheist or an agnostic, holds to this foolish position by blind and baseless faith, not science. It can't be demonstrated, which means it is by blind and baseless faith, not science. And praise God, they don't live consistently according to this blind faith. Rather, they live according to the knowledge of being made in the image of the triune God. It is when they are living in light of reality, being made in the image of the triune God, that they live loving, selfless, honorable, virtuous, moral, productive, meaningful lives. When they live consistently with their naturalistic worldview, everything is meaningless. All is random. Hope is hopeless. Nothing is actually virtuous. It's just physical atoms firing off one way or another. It's all random. Death reigns in that worldview. Death reigns in that worldview. People say everything is relative. Hear it all the time. But what they really mean is that when it comes to the sins they want to preserve, ethics are relative. When it comes to the sins they want to preserve, ethics are relative. When it comes to the sins they hate, or especially when it comes to the moral righteousness they despise, ethics are no longer relative. They're actually absolute. You're absolutely wrong to hold that position, says the relativist. Church, the world is not relative. That's why there, we see such inconsistencies in these people. Love, ethics, honor, virtue. None of these things are relative. These relativists wake up and they assume they're the same person that went to bed. It's not consistent with their worldview to do so. They stop at red lights. Why? Because it's not relative. Red means stop or die and kill other people, then they don't do that because they know the world is not foundationally relative. They don't assume they can fly by jumping off a skyscraper. Why? Because they inherently know their relativism at its basis is false. Ask any relativist if building bridges is just relative. You can use whatever materials you want. You can engineer a bridge however you want. Let your two-year-old do it. See if they drive over that bridge. They won't because the world is not relative. Is open heart surgery relative? Is there really a right or wrong way to do open heart surgery? Ask them. Is rape relative? Massacres, are they relative? Why can't a cop kill a person, let alone a black person? Why not? On what basis does a relative, relativist care who kills who? Often these very same relativists hire doctors to kill their babies. 
And you know what their arguments are? It's usually one of two things. One, ethics are relative. It doesn't really matter. None of this world really matters in the end. Or the second reason is it's not relative. And I have a dogmatic right to kill my child. I'm not making this up. You go out there and you ask these people, those are the two answers you're going to get over and over and over. They live such wildly inconsistent lives. What foundation leads them to this conclusion? What God are they appealing to? Where to where or to in whom is their faith to come up with these conclusions? Where is the faith that comes up with these conclusions? Once someone makes a single moral judgment about anything, they have participated in a robustly religious and faith-based action. The reality is they cannot demonstrably prove one moral decision is better than another if their foundation is pure, random relativism. Pure, random naturalism. They can't demonstrate this. What or whom is their faith in that produces such false conclusions? This is what we must search first within our own hearts. Is our faith intermixed with these baseless faiths at all? You must search your own hearts in this. Is there any measure of your faith that is blind? It's baseless. It's in men. It's in false gods. We must discern if we and others do indeed have saving faith in the triune God and chiefly in the person and work of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We must assess our hearts and the hearts of those we love in this arena. It's eternally changing. You may be asked or be asking yourself, was well, the one true God impossible to know? Does faith in him make sense? Is it a firm foundation? And the reality is God is plainly known through all that he has made. He is seen in everything he's made. We climb on his very words when we hike. We taste that which he has spoken when we eat bacon and drink milkshakes. He spoke all things into existence. Everything is his spoken word. It exists because he said so. We try and create four-dimensional theaters where we see some story on a screen in 2D, perhaps 3D, and we smell some scents being puffed out from over our heads, and we feel random bumps and vibrations and temperatures, and we ooh and ah and spend $24 at Universal Studios for this 15-minute experience. And then we walk into our backyards where we hear God's spoken word through the sound and song of birds, while eating your favorite snack, which he spoke into existence, he imagined it, he created it, and he sustains it and you and the ground you walk on at this very moment by the word of his power. You feel the sun, which he imagined and created and sustains by his word, and you feel the cool grass under your feet. And then we confess I'm so bored. I'm so bored. I'd rather be in the $24 Universal Studios four-dimensional place. There is no God. My life has nothing good. I wish God would speak to me. Oh, his spoken word. You can't even utter those words without him speaking to you. He's by his word sustaining everything around you at all times. People want to spend more time in a virtual reality. Church, we live in his spoken world. This is God's spoken world. You are a spoken image of God bearer. He spoke you and you were. And he sustains you now by the word of his power. You have a speaking role in the greatest story ever told. A speaking role. The story by which all other stories find any measure of their goodness, their truth, and their beauty. We don't need people to write books or to tell us that you just need to sprinkle some Jesus on your life whenever it is convenient for you, and then you can really go about however you want, and that is how you will find purpose and meaning. No, your lives are purposeful. We saw it earlier in Romans 9. The vessel of wrath and the vessel of mercy both have eternal purposes by God. You are a vessel in his story. No detail is overlooked in this story. The most well-known and awarded movies of all time pale in comparison to the role you have in God's story of redemption that you live in every single day. Movies are two-hour, two-dimensional snapshots of someone's life. They are incomparably less than anything 
you have ever done with your real everyday life. We must ask ourselves, would you like your character if you were watching it on a screen? What about what you do in secret? What are your thoughts? What are your goals? Usually things that are revealed to the one consuming the story, the thoughts and the goals of the character. Or would you think as you observed your character in this life, God's story being unraveled right before our very eyes, that you are a liar, boring, sexually immoral, wallowing in self-pity, sinful, blind, and deaf to reality. Are you someone in the story who served the great king over all the earth? Or rather someone who committed unbelievably foolish acts of treason for 10 minutes of pleasure to pursue things that moths and rust destroy, all in selfish service to the great enemy of the high king? Where is your faith? Where is your faith? Ask everyone you know, where is your faith? Is it in blind, random chance, false gods made with human hands like Allah and Zeus, experiences and money? Or is your faith in the one true God? Is it in God incarnate, Jesus Christ? Is your faith in your own ability to perform and obey God's law? Or even worse, some perversion of God's law? Or is your faith in the giver of the law, the savior of those who break the law. No worldview is neutral, church. No worldview. Secular worldviews are not neutral. There is no dichotomy that really exists that says there are secular and religious worldviews. This dichotomy does not exist. All worldviews are religious. Why? They all have faith in things unseen. They all have opinions about God. They all have ethics. They all worship something. All are based foundationally in faith in something. These worldviews have the superficial appearance of being simple most often. We believe in science. That's my worldview. It sounds simple. But in reality, okay, for one, science is just a methodology. It's not a worldview. So even just by hearing it, you're going to have a hard time trying to figure out what that actually means in a day-by-day life. Okay? Because it's a methodology. It's not a worldview. But beyond that, once you start asking deeper questions to any person who claims such a blasphemous thing, you will realize that most of their lives are lived based off unseen things, unscientific things even. There below the surface of superficiality is where you will always find sin in a desire to Preserve that sin. You'll find it every single time. There is where you will find chaos. Below the surface, you'll find lies. You'll find inconsistencies that all have their origins in falsehoods. Now, if you're confused at all at this point, you're saying, I'm struggling to track with everything you're saying about these other worldviews. That makes sense. They are wildly confusing. God's word and his world are not confusing. So if you leave here, that's what you need to know. God's word and his world are not confusing. You're confused because of sinners who want to live in God's world while also rejecting God. That is quite confusing. They want to live ethical lives while denying ethics. They want to live meaningful lives while denying ultimate meaning. These are very confusing things. They want to judge others while not letting God judge them, like Pharisees. They want to earn their righteousness instead of trusting in the only righteous one, like the Israelites. They want to live by science, not faith, but at their foundation, they live lives of faith like everyone else. What they really mean, what they really mean by that statement is that they don't want to place their faith in the triune God or his son, Jesus Christ. That is what they really mean. Rather, they want to maintain their faith in false gods, things made with human hands, things they can manipulate, things that look more like their sinful self. Or perhaps, at best, something outside themselves like good old Mother Earth. Science is founded on the presupposition of the uniformity of nature. Okay? All that means is that tomorrow is going to be like today. Nature is uniform. It has absolute rules that God has established. When you walk outside tomorrow, you're going to walk out into the same front yard you had today. You will not wake up. Open your front door to find out that your house is suddenly on the bottom of Mars, in the middle of Jurassic Park, 
We're in a world where oxygen isn't accessible or that Newton's first law of physics are no longer true, okay? Nature is generally uniform. We live in a fallen world, so there's times where a tsunami might have hit, but those other examples are not going to happen. So we are presupposing a million and one things when we do any scientific experiments to learn about God's world. And because our world is created by the triune God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we can assume that nature is uniform. We can do science. We can do scientific experiments. We can learn many things. Everyone is actually right to presuppose the uniformity of nature. But the reasons they give for why it's okay to presuppose that are not all right. The real reason is because nature exists based on the word of the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is no reason or basis to assume the uniformity of nature if this world is here by random chance. Just as randomly as it came to exist, it could randomly change. Random processes, hear me, random processes do not ever make masterfully crafted and unfathomably detailed objects or systems, let alone consistently over thousands of years. Or to the old earth person, millions of years. Random explosions do not ever create beautifully ordered things. They destroy them. No one lives consistently off that worldview, though. No one lives consistently off that worldview. Rather, people live presupposing that we are designed by God. Everyone desires to create things like our creator God. People desire to live righteously in some way because we are made in the image of the righteous and thrice holy God. We are to love like our God, the God who is love. Everyone knows this. We are to cherish things that are good, true, and beautiful. We cherish anything with redemption. Why? Because we're made in the image of the God who is good, true, beautiful, and all redemptive. People live according to these truths. They live according to reality, but they do so inconsistently when it comes to their confession. Instead of worshiping the creator, they worship the creation. They worship things made with human hands. Again, things they can manipulate, things they can control. Instead of living consistently with faith in the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ, they place faith in false gods, in themselves, and in created things. Everyone understands that the universe was not made by things that are visible. Everyone, including the leading scientists. No one can reproduce the Big Bang Theory in a laboratory because no one knows exactly what was, what happened, how, or why. You can't even begin to reproduce the Big Bang in a laboratory. They live by faith which isn't a problem. That's not, that's not some weird statement. We all live by faith, every person. Faith in things that are unseen. You can't demonstrate it. You can't prove it. Conclusively, science cannot by any stretch of the imagination account for, account for or prove how or why we are here or anything pertaining to what existed prior to the universe. It cannot prove this. Genesis chapters one and two are the only eyewitness testimony we have to what was before the world existed. This is historical science. Everyone is living by faith. Some just foolishly live sinful and inconsistent lives, receiving from God all the good and wonderful things in this life, but giving glory to themselves, men, animals, and dust. Why do they give glory to these people and false gods? We've seen it. We saw it in Deuteronomy last week. Because they hate God, and they do not want to be held accountable for their sins. They pridefully seek to have their eyes blinded more and more because in the darkness, blinded eyes, with blinded eyes, all they can see are their wicked fantasies instead of reality. Faith is the conviction of things unseen. There is no escaping the reality that God created all things. And you choose to either put your faith in the creator God and his son, Jesus Christ, or in yourself, man, beast, or dirt. Those are all your options. One of those is wise. One of those is wise. Even all the gods made with human hands, fashioned after sinful, sinful men, they fail to explain the world. Or they, they fail to answer the very same questions that God asks Job. None of the false gods can answer those questions. The false gods cannot answer because they are no gods at all. They were not there when time began. They don't tell the sun to shine. They do not create the mountain lion or feed the birds of prey. The false gods cannot prove 
the false gods, I'm sorry, cannot explain love, justice, sin, snakes, the cosmos, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, giggling babies, the wisdom of gray hair, the history of Israel, the salvation of the Gentiles, or the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They can't explain foundationally any one of these things, let alone all of them at once. Only the triune God of scriptures can explain all these things and everything else. God had no beginning and he has no end. Even the false gods, church, exist by his word for now because he lets them. Everyone has faith. Everyone has convictions and things unseen. Everyone lives their lives every moment, compiling on the hours, days, months, and years of decisions that are only a couple questions away from revealing they have no solid foundation for why they do what they do. Ask any person why 10 times. Whatever answer they give, ask why again. And you will quickly see. It'll be proven to you, and they will probably even admit that they live every moment of their lives on the basis of a shaky, sandy, blind faith in all that is bad, false, and ugly. Our God created a world that is true, good, and beautiful to degrees we will learn long into eternity. Long into eternity. Take his word for it. Take his word for it by faith. That's what faith is, just trusting God. Take his word for it. Any skeptic, take his word for it. Every person takes his word for it when they enjoy bacon. When they celebrate the birth of their child or they cry over the death of a loved one, every person at that moment takes their word for it. When they explore the world, when they observe in amazement the ant and the blue whale, everyone takes God's word for it at certain degrees. But taking God's word for it when things are purely convenient for you and your sinful desires will lead to utter and eternal damnation. James tells those who believe certain things that God has said about himself, like that he's one, but not other things. He rebukes the person who believes certain things about God and not others by saying, the demons believe he's one and they shudder. Their good theology on certain points will not save them, but rather certain aspects of good theology receiving certain things God has said, but not all of it will actually only further condemn. Now, conclusively, the triune God and chiefly the person and work of the son of God, Jesus Christ is the object of our faith. Okay. The definition of faith is the conviction of things unseen. Our faith is in the son of God, chiefly his life, his death, and his resurrection, and the reality that he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And to conclude, our faith is not compartmental. This is the last thing you need to understand. The definition of faith, the object of our faith, and the reality that our faith is not compartmental. It cannot be broken down into certain days of the week and certain times of the week. It has nothing to do with your parents' preferences or lack thereof. A true, eternal Saving faith, like the Gentiles have that Paul is speaking to, is total, whole, it's complete. It is not tossed to and fro between the true God and the false gods. It's not lacking in understanding of the basic knowledge of who God is, that he created all things, and what he has done in the person and work of his son, Jesus Christ. Whether we are eat, drinking another sip of water or eating a breakfast that we're going to forget the contents of by lunch, we are to do all these things to the glory of God. Both of these otherwise mundane tasks are to be done to his glory. True saving faith impacts everything we do. All your words, all your allegiances, and all your reasons for doing absolutely anything and everything. True saving faith is founded upon the word of God. We are saved through the hearing of the gospel that is in accordance with the scriptures. True saving faith is not ashamed of God's word. It's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not embarrassed by it. It rejoices in the truth. That is God's word. And it hates falsehood. That is everything contrary to God's word. Do we do this perfectly? No. Church, we are saved by grace. Where you hear these things and you think, I don't do that. My faith is so small. It's like a mustard seed. But it's in Christ. It's in the right object. It's in the one 
who sovereignly calls, who sovereignly plans, and who sovereignly saved you. It's not contingent on you. True saving faith is in the triune God and his son, Jesus Christ. True saving faith plays out in saying, let God be true and every man a liar. The one who spoke all things into existence and created language and logic gets to define his own terms. He gets to use the words and authors that he chooses during the time periods he chooses. True saving faith takes God at his word. That's the foundation. We just take God at his word. We trust that he's good for his promises. We trust that the son really did atone for us. True saving faith seeks to suppress lies and exchange lies for truth. It seeks to dismantle lofty arguments, demolishing them, and to tell all who will hear the story of reality, chiefly the gospel of Jesus Christ. True saving faith acknowledges that salvation is by grace and mercy alone. True saving faith is evidence in the once blind person now seeing God's world for what it really is and also seeing that the supposedly wise amongst us are actually quite blind to reality. True saving faith is in the triune God, can't say it enough, and his son, Jesus Christ. It is through this faith that the Gentiles are saved and it is precisely this reality that the Israelites have stumbled over and decided to reject. May God have mercy on them. Instead of recognizing that all of this life is grace, salvation is by grace alone, and Jesus Christ is the only name under heaven by which any man can be saved, they place their faith, and still to this day, in their own ability to complete the law. Their faith is still in themselves and not in the giver of the law. Our text concludes this way, Behold, I am laying laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Do not be put to shame, church. Rather, by faith, receive the Son. Trust in the person and work of the Son. And all who do, whether Jew or Gentile, will not be put to shame, but rather receive eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we give you the glory for all things. We acknowledge that we live lives drowning in an ocean of grace and mercy. We can't even escape it. Like a fish that doesn't even realize it's wet, we at times don't realize that everything around us, Lord, is mercy and grace. The utmost being your salvation to us. Help us to take you at your word and worship you all our days in light of this wonderful grace given to us in your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.